Welcome back to Palmerston North and welcome to Kids Round. The execution is sumptuous. I stand tall, Palmerston North. Your Hurricanes are going to put on a show tonight. It's on here for the Highlanders, it is. Stevenson, a little show gets it off. That is some finish. Goes for the drop goal. Pressure is on the defending champions to keep their title hopes alive. Maha Kolo's got away from Matien. He's done it away to Lev. They win again. The Blues go back to them. Bad just got worse for the Crusaders, but good just got a whole lot better for the Blues. Tēnā koutou katoa. Good evening. Welcome into the breakdown. Well, David Harvelli joins an ever-growing injury list for the Crusaders. We've got Chiefs coach Clayton McMillan joining us on the show a little bit later on. And is one of our greatest ever players, Sam Whitelock, set for a return to New Zealand and to the All Blacks in 2024? We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But welcoming back the panel, Sir John Kerwin, who's very happy, of course. Mills Molina, also happy. Uh, and Jeff Wilson. I'll tell you what, Not JK. Happy. You're not happy. No, I'm happy. With, uh, I'm happy with We're the happy. Sport. It's not happy. You're, yeah. Why would I not be happy? Oh, just your crusaders. It's, just, man. it's great to be here. <laughs> your crusaders. I feel, I feel I'm happy for you. Yeah, I'm it happy. It hasn't for happened myself. very often. I'm happy for myself. <laughs> we were there last night. We got to experience it firsthand. It took a long, long time. A long, long time for the Blues to finally get up over the crusaders. I tell you what, JK. You know, I'm not even a Blues fan. I want a heritage jersey. Those were cool out there last night. Seriously no, they gave cool. me nightmares. I'm not happy about those. Why? Because I remember those jerseys <laughs> being all over us in the early days, to be fair. They were fantastic. Seeing Caleb Clark in the same jersey that his father wore, it was really, really cool. Yeah, pretty cool. Just good, really good to see Paddy out there as well. I yes. thought, you know, he's been out for a while, Mills. Not easy. And they played him for the whole 80-odd yeah. minutes. So, yeah. pretty good run. Yeah, pretty awesome, eh? A 100th game um, for the franchise as well. So, well celebrated and... You know, they got the W, which is even special. I thought it was a great round of Super Rugby because I think what we're seeing is teams staying in the fight. Highlanders stayed in the fight, gave themselves a chance. I think what you can't do is you can't go to sleep. Uh, the fact that we saw what happened, uh, the Waratahs almost running down uh, the Drua over there, which you know that's a challenge. To me, I'm looking at the game. I like what I'm seeing. And it's that, that contest where if you stay in, you hang in, you can change and get momentum really quickly. The only one that sort of blew out, and man, they're going good. I mean, you make 14 changes to your yeah. side. Yeah. yeah. And still, I mean, it, it has the ability to go out and, and guys sort of not really perform. It's a little bit rusty, but the Hurricanes, for me, they just continue that hot form, JK. Yeah, exactly. I think there's a couple of sides that are just looking a little bit better than everyone else. I think the Blues are getting there, but there was 40 minute performance last night, whereas I think the Chiefs and the Hurricanes are just playing incredibly well. Should I stop them right now, now and say they're going to win the title? Oh, I can stop the Blues right now if you want me to. If you want me to say they're favourites, do you want me to do it? <laughs> no. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait. That'd, just like the Australian teams. That'd be good. Like I said last week, yes. I'm going to wait another week. Oops. But getting back to what you said last night, I thought <laughs> it was interesting. The, the try that Omoa didn't get was they were still in the game. And like you say, if you can score, and then get quickly another one. I mean, Queensland, I think, got ahead of themselves, but they, you know, they nearly came back and won it. Well, the blowout performance that you're talking about, Mills, was in Palms North. Fantastic to see rugby taken to the regions because it was jam-packed there at the Speedway. This Hurricane side in 2024, though, Mills, it is a different beast. How much credit do you have to give to Clark Laidlaw, who's coming in for the first season, and, and how much goes to Jason Holland, who's developed these players? You talk about resting 14 players. 14 players, and yet Harry Godfrey and all of these other players just step up. Pretty good, isn't it? And, and I think you're right. They are, they're a happy bunch. You know, yeah. Laidlaw has always been talked about the fact that he brings a really good environment. You know, creates a really good environment. That first game over in Perth that they won, any year they'd go over there and they'd struggle, but they were convincing over there. And you you, you run into sort of super around the following week. They continue sort of that run. I reckon they, they would have targeted those first couple of games to really sort of stamp their mark. Um, and now you've seen the push. I mean, even the Crusaders game. You know, mm. that's a game that they, the Crusaders possibly should have won. But the way that they finished, they just look really complete, really composed at the moment too, JK. Yeah, I mean, when you've got a full squad, and you talk about it often, Goldie, how, you know, even Auckland, mm. or even the Blues, you know, with a couple of injuries now with Sullivan, you know, you've got other guys coming in, and that's the secret. And, and to take that risk, I thought it was a bit of a mistake. I made that mistake when I was coaching. Um, after a couple of big wins, I changed everyone and, and didn't work out for us. So that means your squad is connected. And, you know, Laidlaw is always talking about being connected. You know, I think TJ's been amazing. 
you know, he came on late, I think, and helped really win good. against yeah. Crusaders, but looked great again yesterday. So, you know, I think the combination of a bit of experience um, and these young guys that don't really know anything else but just having a crack. <laughs> so you've got one team who's broken and young, which is the Crusaders. You've got a team that's fit and experienced. So Brad Shields and TJ Piranara, <laughs> they're the two guys you bring into your team when you make changes. That's a significant difference. The Hurricanes are good. The Rebels are not good. No. The Rebels are poor. And when you've got a guy like Filippo Dungunu, who's one of their best players not playing because they haven't paid him yeah. for his, what is it, his relocation costs, yeah. the Rebels are a shambles. And they're going to be gone sooner rather than later, if you ask me, in terms of Super Rugby. You can't have a situation where one of your leading transfers is not available for off-field issues like this. He was one of their best players early in the season when they showed some signs. They beat Moana Pacifica in Hamilton. Mm. But this is not a good rugby team right now. The Hurricanes did what I thought they would do because they are a good side. Hold on, sooner rather than later, do you not think the Rebels will finish the season or are you oh, talking no, about the, next the, year? Well, well you've, got to pay, you've got to pay your players. Look, like. th there's a fight coming for Australian rugby. That's a, a, a bigger question than I have. But, but bottom line is the fact that they haven't been able to establish themselves in Melbourne as a team which can get fans, but also the fact but they're so bleeding money. It's disappearing. Australian rugby clearly doesn't want anything to do with them because they wouldn't have allowed this to happen. No. There's obviously issues there. Would they not be on central contracts as well? Oh, they're, they're, I'm assuming they're Australian players. I just, all I know is that... The, it's, the, it's unwanted, really. I mean, they came into the season with financial woes anyway, and this, adding, adding to this with the player sort of not wanting to sort of play, it, I mean, and then you get a super round as well. So, I mean, the attraction there to, for players or people wanting to play the game in Melbourne, uh, not looking very good considering what's going on. Oh, look, I don't want to disregard what the Hurricanes yes. did because it was great to watch. It was a great night in Palmerston have, North. Really, wonderful. really good. Beautiful night. No wind down there. Don't yeah. get that very often. You know, so all of a sudden they got out and played some great rugby. But if you imagine if it was their starting side, oh. their top team 100 points. coming up... You can't afford that in this competition. And I think now what we're starting to see is the off-field is hurting the on-field. Doesn't yeah, work. Absolutely, the Rebels are shambles. But when you look at the Hurricanes, they've got serious depth in so many positions. You talk about TJ Pedernada, uh, who's backing up Royguard, But look at their Lucies. I mean, their Lucies last oh. week were some of the best in the competition. Then you bring in Brad Shields and Duplessis Karifi. It's the luxury that they've got right now because the squad is connected. Yeah, I, I think it's an all-black discussion. Because I think those, the two young boys, I believe, have a massive future. Mm. Um, Shields doesn't, because he's played for England. Um, Karifi has been around a few years. You know, if he's, I think he's an outstanding player. But these two young guys are really pushing for um, a little bit of X factor. You know, I think they're just like, you know, Yossi, man, he's so dynamic. Yeah. Gets off the base of the scrum. So, you know, they're, they're, but they are great problems for coaches to have, you know. <laughs> Kariffi is dominant over the ball, he's physical. So, what do you do? Not bad, is it? I mean, <laughs> far out. I mean, even the, the young guys that you're talking about, Peter Laka, I mean, you would think this, that uh, Duplessis Kariffi would, would actually be starting. But there, there's a massive, well, it's a huge competition. Did Clark inherit this, do you think? Or has he brought the best out of some of these youngsters? Oh, I think he's brought an element of, of his, sort of, um, well, of his game, creating that environment, possibly possibly pushing a lot of guys. Mm. There's also guys that, that are there that uh, he's had for the under-20s at very late notice last year. So I think he's brought a little bit of, um, a little bit of that. And Jason Holland, obviously, over the, the last few years, has gelled them together. Well, uh, let's talk about your blues then, JK, uh, because they got the monkey off the back. The hypothetical monkey anyway. We know that it had been a decade since they'd beaten uh, the Crusaders at home at Eden Park. It had been a very, very long time. How important was that victory? Was that a coming-of-age performance, JK? Oh, well, it wasn't a monkey for the first 40. It was a gorilla. Oh. And both sides <laughs> sort of played like it, I thought. You know, I said that, for me, both were nervous. The Crusaders... Um, you know, I've never seen a Crusaders side this poor. You cannot lose that many lineouts. Um, so normally you'd think they'd be way more dominant in the first half, but the second half they came out and were just very good, I thought, for 40. Poor in terms of their strengths. I mean, their strength is their set piece. You know, they've always come to Eden Park, and that's an area that they really target sort of the, the Blues, you know, getting up and sort of contesting. Um, but man, not winning those lineouts. Nine lost lineouts on their own throw and 44 missed tackles, Jeff. That's the strength well, you, that you're talking about. If you put these two teams side by side on a piece of paper, there was only one result in this game. 
Pure and simple, there's all blacks in that forward pack. Patrick Tupolotu comes back off of Tawanga Fasi. You've got Rico, you, uh, so you've got Akiri Yuani, you've got Hoskins Satutu. Look, reality, Dalton Popoli, the list goes on. This wasn't a contest on paper that the Crusaders were ever going to win. If they'd scored, the Crusaders had scored a try, um, um, uh, uh, Levi Amua had scored that try. Remarkable piece of defence from Caden Clark to get back. It would have closed the gap. I don't think, I don't think the Crusaders could have come back and won. But uh, let's be honest, we had a 21-year-old hooker throwing to two 21-year-old locks, calling the line-outs. That's why it's misfiring yeah. up against an experienced Blues team. This wasn't even close. The, the thing you have to ask yourself is, I've been hard at work. How did the Crusaders make it? Here we go. It? How do they make this it? This will be good. This well, is because you've got them to win the No, I, I, how do they make I haven't got them to win it now, but all I'll, I'll just say this. I'll how do they make this. what? What are you saying? What I'm saying is it's taken five winning. or six wins. It takes five or six wins, right? They've got the Chiefs at home next weekend. Unlikely, given how the Chiefs good the Chiefs are. But here are their options. They've got the Tars away, the Force, the Rebels and the Reds. Four Australian teams. Two of those are at home. Then they've got the Highlanders away. Which, for them, they'll look at that okay, and think there's a chance. The Brumbies will be tough. They're the one side in Australia really, really hard. Then you've got the Blues at home and Moana Pacifica at home. All right? So they've got to win five games. They can do that. They can is, do that. Now, is the Reds just, at home or away? The Reds, I'll tell you what, that's at home. Now, the Reds just lost to the Force, the worst team in the competition. All right? So the, the Reds you can't tell me... The Reds, are, the Reds weren't good enough to Didn't go and play the, the worst Brumbies? team in the competition. They beat the Brumbies or What's not? So th let's be clear. But let's just be clear. All right, do you want to, in the first round of the playoffs, come up against a Crusaders team that would look like Bauer, Taylor, Newell, Strange and Barrett, Blackadder, Christie and Grace, then, you, then the halfback's an issue. Fergus Burke will be back. You'll have David Havili, Levi Amua, Sevu Reese. Do you want to come up against that, Johnny McNichol? I'm sorry, you don't. You don't. So... They are well and truly. So what, what you're saying... Going, they're going to sneak in, <laughs> and if you finish first, you could have a is Crusaders this, team. Are you doing all this research and work because you picked the <laughs> Crusaders? Just no, 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 like, no, no, I'm just saying... That was last don't, week, you can't, count them out, <laughs> you can't count them out right now based on what they've got in terms of their run home. OK, you they've tell me how many really they can't lose start. then. What's that? They, they can't, so they can lose to the Chiefs? They've got eight games, they've got nine games to go. And they've got to win five of them. They've got to win five, probably get... So they'll lose next week? But so they've got to beat Queensland at home. Yep. They've got to beat the Brumbies. Uh, they've got to beat the touch. Rebels at home. Uh, they'll beat, oh, they can beat the Force away. I mean, the Force have just had their first win. Um, the Waratahs, they've missed a couple of... Um, not losing nine lineouts, they can't. No, no, no. But they've I think clearly got to, I'm just saying, the personnel that are not there, if they snuck in, if they found a way to get the five wins they need... Well, they've got who, players coming you back don't want it's possible. You it's, don't it's, want to play that team at Well, I mean, they're going to be playing number one if they actually sneak in at eight, right? Exactly. And so... You don't want that game. You don't want them to sneak in in, in hot form. But the, it, it's absolutely doable. I mean, this week here, if they can get that... That win against, I don't think, I think the, the, the Chiefs will be too good, but you just never know with these sort yeah. of local derbies, okay? So they go down there, the perfect thing, the, 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 their friend will be the bye. Okay, so yeah. they go refresh, they, they come back exactly what you've, you, you've just mentioned, target those three Australian games, and before you know it, there you go. A couple of you uh, on the panel have been coaches and I just wanted to ask you um, a wee personal story because the questions have started coming in the press conferences to Rob Penny whether or not he is the right man to lead this Crusader side forward. It always happens when teams are, are in a rut like this and you haven't won uh, any games in the season. Uh, he said, uh, someone actually asked him how he was going um, and it was a really nice answer. He said being a grandfather is really helping him, JK, and it just puts everything into perspective. When you were going through a tough time in coaching, what helped you? What will Rob Penny be going through right now to try and galvanise this team? It was absolutely horrible. Yeah. I hated it. I was mentally well, but I got burnt out. I wasn't sleeping. Um, you know, I was really struggling, looking under every possible rock that I could find to try and fix stuff. Losing by two points, like, it was just horrible. Um, I remember going home one night, my wife said, you should get out of this because you look terrible. And So it's not easy and Rob will be suffering. You need to find those, those, those little things. I feel incredibly sorry for him. And when it rains, it pours. <laughs> you know, like, look at the injury list and you're right about the Crusaders. So it's, it's a tough time and... Um, you've got to answer the questions, you've got to turn up and do your interviews, but it's important that, you know, um, we show the, the, you know, the man respect because he deserves it. So it's just a tough time. Hard job, AJF. You've done it before as well. Oh, I've done it badly. 
you know, in terms of results, I can't argue with the fact. Mm. Uh, and you guys there's no doubt it's challenging. <laughs> no, we weren't allowed to be together. No, I'm still upset about that. No, I don't hold grudges. You do? I don't hold grudges. <laughs> no, you do. I don't. Or well, maybe some. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> well, I, I, I go with the fact you've still got to have cattle. Yes. Yeah. But the players have to be good enough. You know, now, sometimes you've got coaches who can take a good team and get them to great, right? But if you're not starting at a level, you're not starting with experience, not starting with all the ingredients you need to be successful in a very challenging competition, it's really, really hard. And when you lose momentum and you start having doubts mm -hmm. and you start looking at things, and then you can all of a sudden start looking at all sorts of things, all manner of things. Yeah. I think if they take a breath, and like I say, they look at the two teams that played against each other last night in Auckland, yes, you can go out and compete. But reality says you don't have the experience or the necessary ability right now to beat a Blues team which has got what they've got. And the other thing, Mills, the mistake that I made was I did look under every rock. Like, if they fix their line-out and maybe just get a couple of decent strikes off the line-out, then they're going to be way more competitive rather than look at everything. Nine, you know, right six. now, you just got to go, let's nail the line-out, yeah? 9-6 at half-time. That was the score. Yeah, Nine, it was six close. at half-time. Just before we move on um, to the Chiefs, just wanted to touch on someone from the Blues. I mean, it's easy when a team's going well um, to stand out, right? Cole Forbes, though, and his story, JK, he's been over playing in Scotland for the last three years, we've just found out. Zan Sullivan, we know, is now going to be out for a length of time. Have they just found a new gem in the sky? What do you reckon, Mills? I, yeah, <laughs> Mills. I, I like the way he, I mean, in the last couple of weeks, he's been, you know, his energy's been there, but some of the touches that he had last night, JK, Man, he was good. Well, did, like, I thought it was his debut, but he came on a loose forward or something. Yeah. I thought he was exceptional when he came on. And his story's a unique one, you know? He went away at 20 or something to Scotland. He was in their extended squad. But the thing I like about him, if you look at him as a rugby player, besides getting a... He's got lovely feet and he's got a bit of pace. Yeah. So that's what I enjoyed about him. And, and he went out there and really took his opportunity. So, and, and Goldie mentioned it before, you know, when you look at how devastated the Crusaders are, you get Sullivan, who's probably your key guy, um, going off, and you get this young, young man coming on and just exploding into it. So that's what you want. OK, well, what about the Chiefs? How do you go from 28 nil up, Jeff, uh, to only winning by seven points? You take off Damian McKenzie. <laughs> is, that, is that not a worry? Because what? in the two matches Definitely. that he has yep. been off for 20 or 25 minutes, the Chiefs have suffered significantly. We saw it round one against the Crusaders, and we saw it again. How worrying is that? Ma massively, if you're Clayton McMillan and yeah. you're this side, because you're looking you at... him. You, well, well, that's how impactful he is for their team. And the fact of the matter is, is when you watch them play, immediately it changes. There's a shift. And the challenge about Damien, though, Mills, is the fact that he's, not, he, he's a unique player in the way that he plays. Mm. So no one can come on and, and play like that. So how do you then adjust tactically for, is it Josh Uwani, is it Caleb Trask, whoever gets that responsibility going forward is then, OK, I'm going to play like this, though, guys. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to play like Damien McKenzie. That's really tough. But they don't. They don't play like him. Yeah. I mean, they almost... I mean, when you see Damien, he's, he's so energetic. The way he takes the ball to the line, he sets up his guys' flat passes right, right at the advantage line. Those other guys sort of come in and they don't, they don't glide in as, as hard as what Damien would. But also defensively. I mean, how about their tackle on Billy Harmon? I mean, yep. you know, he brings that energy. And so I think, you know, when you look at it from uh, Clayton McMillan's perspective, it's how do you get those guys up to keep that? And obviously they, they had a few discipline issues as well, which the, the momentum, they lost a little bit of momentum. But I thought, I thought the, the Highlanders were going to get blasted away after 28-0. Yeah. How did that come back? Never happens. <laughs> we stay in the fight. They did. Oh, you stopped yeah, watching, Jeff. No, I didn't. Did they get better or the Chiefs got worse? Well, a combination of both. Uh, the fact that the Highlanders all of a sudden started, you know, to take some of their opportunities is something they haven't done in the season. They didn't do it the week before against the Brumbies. Got in the attack zone and then all of a sudden weren't able I to get across the line. But th that's a learning experience for the Highlanders as well. I think the biggest issue is that I think Damian McKenzie is changing the way that our first fives play. I've always said it, he plays like a rugby league standoff. Mm. So there's a lot more lateral parts to his game. So when you start building an attack around that and you put someone a bit more traditional on, it does throw you out of your sink yeah. because I think there's a lot of vision involved when Damien's playing because you've got to be alive around him to know what to do. So I think that um, if, if, if I was the Chiefs, you probably need to bring him off more. I can't ask you more, though. Is that... An all-black first fight. Yeah. Mm. How do the all-blacks adjust to exactly what you're saying, You don't JK? want to answer that question, or...? Well, 
I, mean, oh, I think he, 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 he is looking like they're going to be the All Black, yeah. all black 10, right? But do you, the, your question is built around, do you build a game around what, how Demi McKenzie plays as opposed to the yeah. traditionists that you're talking about, JK? And that's the issue. Well, it's not an issue. I, I think it's a good thing that, that uh, Razor Robinson is going to have because yeah. there's no doubt when he plays for the Chiefs, and even last year when he was playing at the Red Brook Cup, you know, his style, it's effective. He Can I answer that? That's 300 yeses. <laughs> like... Do we want to lead the game and change the game or do we want to play traditionally? We've always been the, the innovators and I think that the way that, that Damien plays Easy. is a new way on the attack. I mean, we're so defensive orientated. Yeah. In fact, I was, you know, if, if, if you had a wand and went back, I would have loved to see him out there in the World Cup final a little earlier maybe. You know, I just think he just brings this yeah. thing that defences worry about. And when, defense, when, you, when you've got someone like Damien, defences slow up and that's what you want. Yeah. So I think... I think Razor will embrace it and go, well, let's just build something around him. Yeah, it's a really, really good point and a great discussion uh, as well. Well, someone who had a front row seat to the Damien McKenzie show in Hamilton was the Chief Tuatai, Chief of the Day, of course, to celebrate Kids Round. Hi, I'm, my name's Colby Colbus and I'm the Chief of the Day today. I've been supporting the Chiefs forever. Tell us, who's your favourite player? Damien McKenzie. Damien McKenzie and Colby, what do you reckon the score's going to be here? Chiefs going to get the win, my friend? Yes, but it's going to be close. It's going to be close. Colby, let's get that ball out into the middle of the field, my friend. Away you go. been an absolutely awesome day today for Colby. Um, this has been an absolute dream come true for him. For him and the Chiefs, it means a lot. Colby can't actually play rugby. Um, so to be able to be involved in something like this and something that is, is his biggest passion is pretty cool. Let's go! McKenzie has a chance to run. Down the blind side, McKenzie. Look at a link up with Ratima. The step from Cortez, that's beautiful. It's been very good, eh? Yeah, it's been a good game so far. We started well, but um, got to stay on. Fonlo's a good side, Colby, so. I like spicy stuff. Ew. Yeah. Wow, me too. I have to have it on like everything, except for like cereal and no. ice cream. Does the rain interfere with you? Uh, I'll try and make it not interfere with me. Hey, 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 the Chiefs get another win at home this season. I'm Luke. Hi, Luke. What's your name? Colby. Colby. You enjoy the day? Yeah. You want a uh, sock signature? Yeah, just anywhere. You've been doing a good job today. You've been on the mic. Yes. It's good to hear you enjoyed your experience, yeah. eh? Yeah. Bit of a nervous one out there, eh? Yeah. Sorry, man. You played good. You reckon? Yeah. I wish I scored a try, eh? What an amazing day. The Chiefs have won, and my, this day has been very cool for me. It's been a very cool experience. This is absolutely a very proud moment for all of our family. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he looks like he's having a great day, so thank you, Chiefs. Oh, that is so cool. I'll tell you what, stories like that for young Colby, that probably made his life, Jeff. Did you ever get to do anything like that when you were younger? I was a ball boy at uh, Rugby See, Park in, uh, and in Invercargill for Southland. It was awesome. Yeah. Great experience. I don't know how much of the game I watched. <laughs> Played a lot of one-on-one -on -one down the sideline. Every sudden they're <laughs> looking for a rugby ball all day. But here oh, you go. you weren't doing yeah. your job. Oh, no, I'm not doing my job at all. <laughs> I just wanted to be on the field. It was amazing, you know. And that, but those were the days when you had the... I mean, this, you've still got the iron, the tin fence where everyone's banging on that. It was sec second division Vinegar. Star. Yeah, vinegar or tomato sauce? What, what? On your chips. Oh, tomato sauce all day. Mm. I thought gravy, gravy, gravy nowadays. Gravy, gravy nowadays. It's a great place in <laughs> Dunedin. That's what I went for when I was a kid. Yeah. The hot dog and the chips. How yeah. good was it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah no. Really, really cool story there. Thank you to the Chiefs for sharing that with us and to Colby and his dad as well for heading along and being our reporter for the day. Um, right, I'll tell you what is amazing, Jeff, and that is the Fijian Drewers' extra time win in Fiji against the Waratahs over the weekend. It was so dramatic. Seven minutes into extra time, a drop goal uh, from young Valentini. It was absolutely brilliant, a thing of beauty. But the story gets deeper because two years ago, the Drewer played the Waratahs. The Waratahs beat them in 2022. Darren Coleman was the coach at the time and people were pumping up the Tars after this victory. Darren just wanted to temper expectations and he basically said, well, hold your horses. We haven't beaten the Chicago Bulls here. It is the Fijian Drua who are fresh into Super Rugby. Well, Mick Byrne, the coach of the Drua then, who is still the coach of the Drua now, he's, he's had a say. 
Oh, I think, you know, um, we may not have played like the Chicago Bulls and we may not have won like the Chicago Bulls, but we won. And that's it. That's the most important thing. Two years in the making. He turns up to the press conference in a Chicago Bulls hat, JK. I love it. I love the way he wears his heart on his sleeve. And he's standing up for his players in this team. Well, he should go to Goldie for grudges. <laughs> no, no, he's, he's not, hold, he he's not wearing his it. heart on his sleeve. He's holding a grudge. Yeah. And you <laughs> use that. You use that any, when you're a coach. Whatever and when works you're fine, you. Whatever it works to get a little bit extra out of your team. The players who were involved would have remembered that. But that's gold. That's, oh. that's outstanding. The fact that he knows exactly. He, it wasn't convincing in the end. He would have liked it to have been yeah. easier. And I wonder the hat's sitting there going, oh dear, this, this one, I'll get used today. Right? I'll just put, <laughs> someone <laughs> just put that one away, will you? Put it under there, you know? Was that, was that drop kick a toe hack? Because he was oh, so straight. You would know. It was, yeah, I'd never <laughs> drop kick a good in my life. But it looked, like, fantastic. Well, Mills, let's bring in your moments then, because your moments this week oh. are all about the perfect droppies. So we're going to show that, JK, just to Ooh. see if it is uh, a toe, toe hack from, um, you know, the, the draw and Valentini. And, oh, good. I mean, a penalty advantage. And look at the scenes. And that is the winner. And so that moves on to my moments, obviously, here. Dan Carter dubbed the thriller in the chiller down in Christchurch, winning that game. How about this guy here? Doesn't go off his left foot, he goes off his right, wins the Rugby World Cup, Johnny Wilkinson. Zinzan Brook, he gets a shot. Hey, look, number 17 down there, because I'm told by Marshy that uh, he was over -called. That's John James, Pre uh, John Pre Preston. Preston, yeah. John Preston, yeah. And Mertz, and we've seen this plenty of times as well, Marshy's involved the, there. The there first, he is, how good. The first pass from Marshy was better than the second pass. Uh, that why, was why, did he, why did he say hello to the crowd after that? Was there something, <laughs> was there a grudge in there somewhere? Is that oh, it's just after Mertz. That? No uh, one holds a grudge like Andrew Mertens. <laughs> no. Oh, and because he's got such a great memory. Every, he can remember everything and anyone who's ever wronged him <laughs> in his entire life. If you've done it, you know. The moment you see him, he will absolutely remind you of it. Uh, the the Zinzan Brook one's a great story, you know, because, you know, Marshy turns around and sees the two options, and he thought, oh, "I better give it to Zinni. I mean, you know, like, <laughs> it's just a big, give it to him first. They never looked like missing, to be fair. Um, my question mark is that what was he doing there in the first place? Waiting for the drop kick. Well, he used to practice a lot. Did he? Back in the pocket. Well, oh. what about uh, one that you may be missing, Mills? And that's Matt Dunning, uh, the oh, former. This. this is crazy, right, this Jeff? Is absurd, when you think right? about it, 28 metres out, he absolutely nailed it. And then he got nailed by his team because he kept his team out of the playoffs because they needed to win by two tries. Yeah. I, I remember watching this at the time and we we're going, seriously, this is to try and make the playoffs. Beautifully struck. That it was nice. Oh, for a, was he problem. not trying to get it? Was he not trying to. Apparently oh, he wasn't. No, I mean, that time of the game, brain explosion, <laughs> you know. I mean, if you're not trying to get it, seriously. Why, why are you not I, kicking I, I, it? Yeah, I'm surprised you could. I mean, I wave it off. Don't want it. Don't want it. It was an honest mistake. But. Yeah. The best part about it is his teammates are absolutely livid oh, with yeah. him. <laughs> you can see them. Can't take just... it away from them. He's, a, he's got a super rugby drop goal. He does. And it was, uh, it was pretty perfect as well. Thank you for your moments, uh, Millsy. Uh, time for a quick break, but we will be back right after this. Clayton McMillan is joining us on the show, and we're going to chat about Sam Whitelock's potential return. No, my hockey, my welcome back into the breakdown. Great to have you joining us, and great to head down to the mighty Waikato region where the Chiefs coach Clayton McMillan joins us now live. Uh, some people would just say a win's a win, Clayton, but your team obviously has very high standards. You were clearly not too happy with the performance uh, in Hamilton yesterday, but on a positive note, a couple of your returning players, firstly Josh Lord last week, and then Amoni Narua this week, both of them have been out with length. The injuries. Can you talk to us a little bit about these young stars? Yeah, fantastic to see them back, uh, Kirsty. Um, you know, both have had an unfortunate run of injuries, um, and you know, but it was great to see them back out on the field. Josh Lord, you know, big man, mm. um, adds a lot of value to our set piece. Obviously, saw his ability, sort of why uh, his his ball skills and speed sort of come to the fore at times yesterday. So he's he's been a welcome addition back into the into the team and also um Imani, you know, like he had a bit of a breakout year last year and 
had to um, you know suffer the misfortune of being ruled out of the World Cup, which was tough for a young man to take. But he's you know dealt with that in his stride and worked really hard to get back. And you know it was um, good to see him back out on the field too. Clayton, um, I know he's taken a few dings already this year, Damien. But I just love the way he plays it at uh, first five. Do you just give him a free reign, or do you have to rope him <laughs> in a bit? Oh, it's a bit of a balance of both, I think, JK. I think he's, you know, matured a lot and he's he understands that that sort of, you know, that um that renegade in his game that, you know, used to be pretty, pretty prevalent um in his in his younger years, uh, kind of needs to be tempered somewhat, but but only to not to an extent that we actually, you know, take away from him what he's really good at, and that's playing on instinct and backing his skills. Okay, I want to ask about your sort of young guys. I know you've got guys coming back and really exciting, but some of these guys, you know, your honours, also Poi Hippie in particular, he's moved around a little bit. And I think the average age is around about 23 or 24. But guys like that for you, I mean, they must excite you given, you know, the, the load they've been under as well. Yeah, absolutely. Mills, like something that we've um, had a deliberate strategy around um, is to, to build, you know, the cohesion in our team. So it's, it's still a, a, an extremely young team. Um, in comparison to a lot of others, but we've played a lot of rugby together now, and you know, that, I guess that's um, part of the reason why we uh, um, have been enjoying some success. Um, sometimes we find a way to win a game we probably don't deserve to, um, and and often it's been the unheralded guys like you know Daniel Ronda, Rama Kapoi Hippi, um, Kalen Boshier, guys that perhaps um, have set you know a little bit in the shadows of some of our more. Uh, well-recognised players, but um, they're the real glue and, you know, they're going to be the future of the Chiefs. Clayton, I was stoked my boys in the last 20 minutes kept you honest, the fact that it kept you on your toes. But I want to, and I talked a little bit earlier on the show around the margins for error and the fact, but also the ability of teams to score points and score quickly. Now, in the old days, we used to be able to shut down a game. You get two tries up, and all of a sudden you're thinking to yourself, play a bit of territory, we'll be able to keep control of the scoreboard. Do you think it's different now? Do you think, I suppose, you have to be more aware? Are you ever comfortable with a 14, 16, 20-point lead? Or does the nature of the game now mean that it can change and change very quickly? Yeah, I think the dynamics change a little bit late. You know, a team like the Highlanders, um, who have shown you know, vast improvement, um, have demonstrated an ability to you know score tries and they've got some some real expected players here and perhaps when the game looks like it's a little bit out of reach then they you know, start to chance their arm a little bit more they start offloading in contact um, they start taking quick throw-ins and and those are the sorts of things that make them make them dangerous but perhaps don't necessarily have the, the courage to do early on in the game when it's more about sort of percentages and for us, you know, part of our challenge um, and has been all year and potentially the biggest part of my frustration on the weekend was that we would put ourselves in commanding positions to to really put foot on the throat and kick away in games. But, um, you know, we we start to get a little bit, um, you know, enthralled in the sexy side of the game instead of just, you know, doing the stuff that sort of looks really pretty, but is essentially just the basics done really well. Clayton, you've uh, got a young lock in Josh Lord. You've uh, lost someone like Retallick. News this week is, uh, sorry, you lost Retallick. The news this week is that White Lock's coming back into that all-black environment. You think that's a, a positive or a bit of a hindrance for the young locks? Um, well, look, I think the first thing is that just what an incredible player and, you know, he's left a... A massive legacy here in New Zealand and and for the Crusaders and um, and when you look at the the young locks around the around the country, we've certainly got some outstanding talent coming through. And I guess the question really is, do we 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 chuck them in the hot seat and they they learn by being out in the middle? Um, but can that can that learning be accelerated by having somebody of his standing sort of walking alongside them? I think there's a real balancing act there and. Um, It'll be fascinating to see how that all unfolds. Clayton, we appreciate your time on the programme. Thank you for giving up your Sunday evening for us and all the best heading down to Christchurch on Friday night. All right, guys. It's my pleasure.
Oh, absolutely brilliant. Um, let's pick up on what Clayton McMillan just said there. With the potential news, it is just reports at the moment that 153 Test All Black, double Rugby World Cup winner, you cannot forget uh, the legacy of this man. Sam Whitelock has been playing his rugby over in France at Poe with uh, his younger brother. We thought he was done with New Zealand rugby. We thought he was done with the All Blacks. But it turns out a conversation has been had between him and the uh, new coach, Scott Robertson. And Maybe he's not quite done with international rugby yet. Clayton just said it's a fine balancing act. Where does everyone sit with this news? Would you be happy to welcome back this legend into the environment, or do we not actually need him, JK? Oh, I'm in favour. I think it's a, I think it's a positive. I'm in favour of Bowden and Whitelock coming back. Will they start? I don't think so. But do they come off the bench? Do they get through to the next World Cup? I hope so. You know, we saw it, you know, with Coles coming on late, who do you want? Someone with experience. And I think what we've got to realise is that a lot of our players are leaving. So we've got 660 players overseas. So to lose that experience for the All Blacks, we've got to win in between World Cups as well as the next World Cup. So, you know, I'm in favour. Can I just come back to something you said there? You think that Sam Whitelock could make the next Rugby World Cup. Australia 2027, he'd be 40. You think Why he not? could... It can make the All Blacks team. Why not? What does that say about the current locking stocks in New Zealand then? Well, I don't think he starts. But, but do we not those... have good enough players? I mean, we've been talking well, about for me, Josh for me, it's Ward, like, for me, it's like, if you are fit and good enough, does he start? No, but the last 15 of the next World Cup, it's going to be close. Who do you want running on? Someone with 20 test matches or someone with 152? I think so. I, it, it depends on how they're using him. I, I think... I don't know whether, he, and he's a legend of the game, you know, the most kept All Black of all time, but how are they going to use him? We're obviously in a period where there's a possibility that we're down in terms of that experience in our locking department, and he's huge. So to have him in that environment, if he's good enough and he's in there and he's beating the other guys, which I don't kind of think will kind of happen in the next three or so years, mm -hmm. his, his immediate job, obviously, is to try and get these guys up to speed, because the IP that he's got and the experience, it's huge. That's world class. And so if they're bringing him back um, pu purely for that, and if he's good enough to play above these other young guys, then you play him. Jeff, I remember something that you said last year. You were worried about losing Sam Whitelock and his IP, what Mills talks about, because you thought he was the last student of the game in that position. The best student of the game that we've had at the line-out time for a long, long time, probably if ever. Yeah. And what, he, what he brought to the All Blacks and what he brought to the Crusaders. And so there's no doubt that that's something the All Blacks are looking at and going, we see real value in that. Mm. So the, the question mark I have here is that how often are you prepared to start doing this when players who head off overseas and say yeah. Lester Fyangonuku decides at the end of this season in France, you know what, didn't really like it here, I'm now off contract. Yeah. Bowden Barrett was always coming back, his is a, a sabbatical situation, so they're vastly different scenarios, right? Um, Sam Whitelock's got, I think, a, another option, another year that was part of this uh, at Poe, he goes, I want to come back and play. Now, it's whether or not you're comfortable players walking yeah. straight back into the All Blacks. Mm. Now, I know you are. At 152 not... tests, I totally am. Yeah, I Leicester, that. no. Yeah, well, I, I just understand it. So this, these are doors that I know Scott Robertson has talked about in terms of maybe opening these and looking at players. I know I think he went through Japan and had a chat to Richie Moonga, OK? So he's looking and keeping in touch with some of these players to see maybe whether or not their circumstances are changing. The issue I have is if we go down this path and all of a sudden you welcome all these players back in, how much is this devaluing Super Rugby? So these superstars... Well, that, well no, 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 I'm just saying, let me just finish. You're devaluing it because these players all of a sudden get a choice to go, what, I can go and play up until July overseas and then all of a sudden I'm a free agent, mm. come back and play a few games maybe if, to qualify, which you can do, play a few games like uh, TJ Piranara did, uh, Damien McKenzie did, they come and played a few games of club rugby, provincial rugby, they're available for the All Blacks again. Are we comfortable with players doing that, just deciding halfway through the year, I'm coming back? Not every player I'm not comfortable with, but if I can just go back to something about what, what you said about devaluing Super Rugby. If you have players resting from the All Blacks, if you have players going away on sabbaticals, you're not that worried about Super Rugby. All you're worried about is the All Blacks, and that has been the case. We know that. It's the high-performance pool for the All Blacks. Until we change that, and I think it needs to be changed, you know, we need to extend Super Rugby, we need to have a competition where they can keep the television rights, the famous Heineken Cup that I keep talking about, and 
I know that you've been talking about changing the, the pay system. Until we let the Super Rugby teams stand on their own, they're going to be high performance for the All Blacks. And I don't like it, but it's been working for but us. I'm actually, in terms of the Sam Whitelock thing, Mills, I look at this and go, there's a really tough year for Scott Robertson to start. Yeah. Really challenging season. A mm. couple of test matches in... South Africa, there's an end of year tour which involves playing Ireland and England and France, plus another And two. Italy. And, and <laughs> Italy, and Italy, and Japan. So there's this, all of these things, you know. Um, England are coming here. They were semi-finals in the Rugby World Cup. Yeah. So you add all these things up. Would he be really valuable right now for this season? I think Just so. Just for a year. Yeah. And so for us, yeah. now that's where I can feel really comfortable. Yeah. I don't think Rugby World Cup at 40. <laughs> that's a bit beyond, I think that's a bit beyond my imagination. Maybe in your imagination, but not in my imagination. But in terms of what he could offer for a season to play maybe six or seven test yeah. matches, if he's on top of his game, I think really valuable. Case by case. I think, and... and He's a perfect case, right? If you're going to bring him back and he's good enough to be in that environment to get... You've got to also remember, we've lost Retallick. Well, why don't you just bring Brody Retallick back then? Well, he's not the most kept <laughs> ever. And, and possibly... Uh, yeah. Okay. No, but look, I, I think every story is different, Kirst. You know, I think that um, Brody's apparently very happy in Japan and wants to finish his career there. You know, I think Whitelock wanted to go and play with his brother. I mean, playing in France 37 games a year, getting the... <laughs> you know, kicked out of you every week, um, is not Japan, right? Japan, we all know, is a little bit easier, so... We shouldn't forget last year how good he was. Yeah, oh, the rugby world coming off the bench. He was outstanding. Yeah. And so to, he actually found some of his moment, best form for Ireland. years. So I'm not, I'm not doubting if he was in that, in that sort of health and condition and form, if he comes back from France like that, you know. You'd be OK with it for I, a year. I'd be OK for it for a year, but I don't want this to become the norm. Mm. I don't. Mm. Yeah, but, but are you Go, but saying you don't want it to be the norm, or do you, well, is it the devaluing of the Super Rugby? If we played me, our Super Rugby players properly, we wouldn't have this problem. OK, but if it's 150 test match like Whitelock, so I don't think you can make the, the, the comparison to Leicester, because he left early. Well, how many and, tests has he had? Ten. And, and, and I accept that. So let's put 80 test matches on it, and you can come back when you want, or 100. It's only four people, isn't it? Mills, you can come back. <laughs> no way, man. You're about the same age no right now, aren't you? Hey? We could keep having this conversation over and over, couldn't we? Um, but it is a really great debate to have. Time for trivia now. So sit back, you guys, uh, because you know you're not involved in it anymore because you squabble too much and you argue about the and question. And we were wrong. And you're always wrong. OK, so your trivia question for you at home, for you sitting uh, on the couch, this is your trivia question this week. Now, Edward Hughes is the oldest ever All Black. But who is the second oldest? Who is the second oldest? We've got a list for you right after this. Do not go anywhere. There is still plenty more to come on The Breakdown. Throws it up to Dane Coles, and the hooker is under the post. Dane Coles exploded onto the ball. Simpson drop, he's trying a drop kick. There he is again offloading, finding no! Oh, that was brilliant from Sonny Bill Williams. Piece of hit. This could be another extraordinary try. Christian Cullen, the hero of the hour. And Dan Carter, Carter kick and chase, and Carter scores! What a beauty! Wow! He's got the bounce, he's handed off his opposite! Lamu! Oh, oh! What I loved about Jonah because he was the best in the world at evasion, because he's a hell of a quick as well as strong. So if you have a look at a lot of those ball carries, they've normally got a step in them, so he's hitting the weak side of a ball, of a tackler. And then he carries him, and then another one tries to come over top, and then there's another one, quite often he's got three of them dragging, but it's, it's because of that ability to offset people, hit a weak side, which then allowed him to use his explosive speed and his, and his size. Yeah, the teams tend to keep the play away from Jonah. That is going to be a fantastic series, and we're going to get the guys' uh, thoughts on their All Black game changes shortly. But first, the trivia question. So, we've just asked you, uh, who is the second oldest All Black? Of course, Ned Hughes is the oldest, so the second oldest. Here it is. We've got a full graphic that shows you one to ten. Uh, who is the oldest? I'd Dane Coles. I would have got this right. 
Really? Said, I, yeah. Second oldest. Yep. I was working on that game. But look so. at look at the names and, and look at the ages of some of these players. Like the longevity of Brad Thorne. Yeah. I mean, oh. for him to be able to play at that level, uh, at that age. Kevin Milam is another one as well as emails. Are we sure Frank Bunce was 35 and 305? I'm not sure. Is that his... I never, was never well, sure you, of his you, age. You, I'm you, never, never, was that accurate? Is that, accurate? Is that accurate? I reckon he was older. I reckon he was older. Yeah. So Sam Whitelock um, is in featuring in the top ten of oldest All Blacks, uh, but he turns 36 in October. So that's where he's on the list. He must be just below the top ten. Uh, righto, it is time now to talk our All Blacks game changers. Players that change the game in their positions. We're going to start off with you, Mills. Who was it for you? Who changed their position over the years? For me, it was. It had to be Sir Michael Jones. Um, the fact that he started as a seven, he roamed out wide, um, but then when he sort of changed, had that horrific injury, he became this guy, the enforcer that we sort of always sort of known, the number six to be. Uh, chopped people in half, but still was able to sort of roam. So for me, I thought he he was awesome. Changed the game, JK. Michael Jones. Yeah, totally. Sir I mean, I played I played with him when he was, uh, you know, when he didn't have the knee injury, and he was just this incredible athlete. I remember making a break in the World Cup, um, and I was going full pace, and I turned, and he was jogging beside me. <laughs> I gave him the ball, um, dynamic, and then I think the. You know, great players change the way they play. Mm. And after his injury, he went into that enforcer that you said, Mills. So totally changed loose forward play. Your game changer, JK? Uh, Jonah, I think, for me, was um, on two fronts. He was just an absolute athlete. Like, he was huge, he was fast, he was strong. Um, but he was our first, also, superstar. Mm. He took our game to, to new levels. So for me, he was not only on the field, um, off the field, you know. I groomed with him in his first test match. One of the shyest men I've ever met, wouldn't say boo. And he grew right through that. So taken from us too young, but definitely a great change of the game. Yeah, I played with him at age yeah. group level, at high school, in you know, a high school level. Um, it's a privilege to have been on a team with him. Helpful to be on a team with him, <laughs> rather than coming in. Ever had to play against him. Um, yeah. Frightening experience. Yeah. Um, but when he was in his prime, I mean, he's unstoppable. There's very few players that are unstoppable in a game. Mm. He was unstoppable. What about off the field? The larger-than-life character who really changed the game of rugby in a professional sense. What was it like to just be around him, to walk down the street with him, you know? Oh, I, mean, I felt for Jonah because yeah, it came really quickly and he yeah. was a young man. Mm. The, the pressures, expectations, mm. you know, and he was dealing with, obviously, um, some health concerns and issues, serious health concerns and the expectations every time he went out to play. And then there was no doubt, and, and you were part of it as well, Mills, is the fact that when you're part of the team, all of a sudden the fans said they only wanted to see Jonah. Mm. And it was convenient for us because it made our job easier because all of a sudden, <laughs> but he's signing thousands and thousands of autographs. He oh. handled that so, so. I mean, such a suit. I mean, you, you've never seen wingers that big, you know, <laughs> over 120 odd clicks and then he was, and he was running that fast. But... Such a generous guy too, you know, with, with his time and, the, and, um, and, and so young. I and mean, obviously with a guy sort of growing up and looking up to him, he was immense. But he definitely, I mean, he, he changed the way the world looked at rugby yeah. and also all black rugby too. What about you, Jeff? For you, who who's I've got one in Otago, mate. In Otago, su mate. Surprising. Yeah. No, no, it? that's not surprising. I, I think um, the game changed, and uh, just bear with me here, when we played... The forwards, and when we started, the forwards' responsibility was to get the ball to the backs, right? So it was a scrum, line-out, maul, whatever it was. And so it was, a, it was carnage and mass. You hit rucks and players coming from everywhere, right? And so the game sort of changed, I think, early 90s. Auckland did some d different things. Um, and then it turned professional. And, and so the only way to get possession back, you know, was through the counter-ruck. Whereas then it changed and all of a sudden... The Fetcher arrived, and I think Josh Confell was the first of those, where he was tracking the ball, he was tracking the ruck, he was the support player as well. He did that really well, but when you watched him, he, got, he had his head on the ball at every time, whether on defence or attack, you know, he was always there in support. But it was his work defensively on the ball, where all of a sudden, all of this stuff, great. He's, you know, he, he did this easy, but defensively he was on the ball. And so he won the race. So before the ruck became, or sorry, before the tackle became a ruck, he became that first guy. And the fetcher became the jackler. And now everyone does it. And so this is before George Smith, David Popock, mm. 
Richie McCaw, um, Neil Back. He was the first guy. Incredibly long arms. He had these big long arms, and he's always uh, slouched over. He walks like that now because he spent most of his time over the ball. And so for me, when I look at it and we think how now that changed the game yes. and how it's affected the ruck and how we've had to change the laws yeah. to try and get this and, and put restrictions about what they can do for me, you can see him, his tracking, his nosing, and bam, he's on the ball. I think he was the first. Does he get the credit that he deserves for what he actually uh, did for the yeah. game, do you yeah, think? Yeah, I think he was, like... You know, he was someone that changed the game. He was yeah. that guy that was... So I think it was 87, actually, Goldie. What happened was um, the All Blacks of 87 completely changed the game. So we wanted to get it wide. I was sort of lucky I was part of it, Mills, because the loose forwards had to then support. And then if you go a bit further, you put contesting in at the ruck, then you had to be an athlete and also contest. How many rucks did you clean in your career? None. Yeah, and, and I probably did about 10 by the last three years I had to actually do it. Right? Well, so came, it came in when I started, was starting to play. I mean, I had to go to Iraq, so I was all... Yeah. I don't want to do, but you had looked at guys like that, you know. I mean, you always see, sort of seen the headgear and watched and Josh Confess would yep. get out of the ball. Pretty cool. This is why we're talking about the All Blacks game changes. Players that change the game and their position. That series that's coming up a little bit later on in the year is going to be absolutely brilliant. We're almost done. That is almost time up for us. Uh, quickly tell us, will the Crusaders get a win this weekend? No. 0-6. Chiefs on Friday. Chiefs win it. It's unlikely. Unlikely. But I'll be down there, and I want to see the best of them again. OK. And just get out there and fight. Easter They'll keep scrapping. They'll keep scrapping. Easter there weekend in Christchurch. Highlanders, Hurricanes coming up in Dunedin as well. It's going to be a great weekend of rugby, and we'll see you next Sunday. We have got a grandstand finish.